Welcome to Law Sessions. I am Jennifer Hausen. In this law session, we will consider remedies in contract law and what occurs in situations where there's been a breach, for example, and to what the innocent party is entitled. Now, there are various remedies which exist in contract law, and these remedies, of course, can range from damages to one party repudiating the contract to rescinding the contract seeking specific performance or an injunction or indeed obtaining some sort of restitutionary award. Now damages is of course the common law remedy and if we start first with damages because it is quite likely that this is a starting point in any kind of breach as it relates to the party's relationship. Now you can consider damages from two standpoints unliquidated damages, which is damages which the court assesses, or liquidated damages, which is damages which the parties have agreed between them. Now, the purpose of unliquidated damages, of course, is to compensate the plaintiff for the loss he has suffered as a result of a breach of contract. Whereas, when you consider liquidated damages, this is where the parties have stipulated that a particular sum must be paid if there is a breach of contract. Now, if the sum represents a genuine calculation from a pre-estimate point of view, then the courts will, of course, ensure that it is enforced as liquidated damages. But if the amount which you're seeing subsequent to a clause between the parties is not genuine but appears simply to be a clause which seeks to put the other party in fear in order to perform and therefore it is a clause which says in the event of breach you're going to pay me a set amount so for example let's say the contract is a hundred thousand pounds and you say well in the event of breach you have to give me a hundred and fifty thousand pounds well it's not referable even to the value of the contract, but seems more to do with uh, frightening the other party into ensuring that he performs. If that is the case, then it will amount to a penalty, and the courts will, of course, not enforce a penalty. What you need to consider then when you're looking at circumstances like this is does it fall or is the figure that the parties agree in between them, does it fall on the side of a liquidated damages clause or does it fall on the side of a penalty clause? Now, the distinction can be grasped if you take the time to look at the case of Dunlop Pneumatic Tire and New Garage and Motor Company. It does give you some indication of the uh, one against the other. We do mention this case shortly uh, to do with something else, but certainly in the context of contract and the difference, it is a case that you may wish to look at. Now, just because penalties are not applicable as it relates to a breach of contract, it does not mean that the courts will not enforce it and the courts will certainly uh, applied in circumstances where, for example, there is an acceleration clause. So it says, you know, it, in circumstances where something happens, you can, of course, accelerate what is owed or accelerate payments and whatnot. That's not a problem. Where, for example, there are deposits or money is paid and you're looking at a clause which is other than a breach of contract clause, then even if you're looking at a clause which declares it a term, these are situations where the courts will enforce a penalty clause and it would be perfectly legitimate. It's just that a penalty clause, which is a penalty clause for breach, will not be upheld by the courts. Now then, let's look at damages in some depth. When you look at damages, this is your legal remedy, which is available for a breach of contract, meaning it's your common law remedy. Now, it is an award of money, <clears throat> and the idea is to compensate the innocent party. So damages is there to compensate the injured party. It is not there to punish, punish the breaching party. And the case, of course, which um, stands for that proposition is Roxley's Electronics and Construction and Foresight. 
in 1995. The principle then is that the primary purpose of damages is to place the injured party in the position they would have been had the contract been performed. Contracts are made to be performed. So the idea is that if there is a breach, then the contract has not reached the point where it has been performed. As such, the innocent party is placed in a position as if it had. Do not confuse this with, with tort, which says that the purpose of damages there is to put the injured party in the position he would have been had the tort not been committed. So it is never to put him in the position he would have been if the contract had not been performed. No, it must be to put him as if the contract had been performed. Case in point, of course, it is Addis and Gramophone in 1909. It is a House of Lords case. Now, the claimant was employed as a manager by the defendant, and the defendant, in breach of the contract, dispensed with the claimant's services and got a new manager to replace him. Now, the claimant's action, which was brought for breach of contract, he claimed that the level of damages should reflect the circumstances in which he was dismissed because he said the way that they dismissed him damaged his reputation and also it impacted on his ability to find subsequent suitable employment. Now the courts held that contract law seeks to put the party in the position they would have been in had the contract been performed. He was therefore limited to claiming wages and loss of commission which would have been his during the contractual period and indeed for the period when the defendant ought to have given him notice. The court said that there was no right to exemplary damages or damages to reputation in contract claims. Uh, of course, you can draw a parallel to this with the United States, for example, where they have punitive damages. And we see sometimes you get a situation where the value of the contract probably is about $50,000, but the punitive damages runs into tens of millions and that sort of thing. That's not the way it is in English law. It just seeks, as far as contract law damages are concerned, to put the parties in a position as if the contract had been performed. The court said that when you are trying to seek things like exemplary damages or damages for reputation, then you should seek to couch your action in terms of the law of tort. Now, Lord Atkinson, the case said one of the, these consequences is that the plaintiff is to be paid. So one of the consequences when looking at a breach of contract is that the plaintiff is to be paid adequate compensation in money for the loss of that which he would have received had his contract been kept and no more is what Lord Atkinson said. So if we look at the four broad methods of compensating the plaintiff, they tend to be expectation loss on a reliance loss basis, on a restitution basis, and certainly any sort of consequential loss. Now, expectation loss, which is loss of a bargain, you will also see it called that. This is the traditional basis for assessing contractual damages. Now, reliance loss is where you're looking at your out-of-pocket basis. And this is, the, this is generally the norm for assessing damages in tort. But because expectation damages would be difficult, for example, to assess, then damages on a reliance basis could be awarded for breach of contract. Well-known case, of course, is McRae and, Commonwealth Dis uh, McRae and Commonwealth Disposals Commission in 1951. This was the case with the salvage ship, which where they said that uh, I believe there was a uh, they said there was a, a ship. The Commonwealth Disposals Commission said there was a, a ship at the coast of Papua New Guinea, and that they agreed that, you know, uh, McRae uh, or persons there could get the salvage. But they came to this contract. The problem was there was no such ship. Now, it's an interesting decision simply because if you go back to what we have previously discussed in a previous law session, if we had looked at it from a mistake point of view, which is pre-contract, which is uh, contractual, the problem with mistake, of course, is that you're saying that the parties were mistaken as to the subject matter. 
In McRae, they did not go down the route of mistake. Rather, they looked on how the damages should fall. And with McRae, they said that the calculation of damages would be on a reliance loss because monies had been expended to do with all this expensive diving gear and all this. So the court said reliance loss because expectation loss, they could have got nothing from the salvage. They could have gotten something from the salvage. They wouldn't have known. The best calculation there, of course, would have been on the basis of their reliance losses. They've spent money out relying on what was told to them. Second, of course, a case that shows this is Anglia Television and Reed, which is a 1972 case. And there, uh, the courts again considered this whole point of how uh, damages ought to be calculated. Now, a plaintiff may freely choose between expectation and reliance damages unless he has made a bad bargain, in which case, Damages on reliance basis will not be awarded. In the case of that is CNP, Haulage, and Middleton. The point is, the court is not there to fix a bad bargain, and you will hear that. The point is that if parties are breaching a contract which they have legitimately made, the courts will step in. But the court's job is not for you to have entered into something made an error and then seek to resolve from it and then rely on the courts. It's not there to support a bad bargain. So CNP says it is for the defendants to prove that they, uh, that they have not, uh, sorry, for the plaintiff to prove that he has not entered into a bad bargain. Um, another uh, important case as well in that regard is uh, CCC Films London Limited and Impact Quadrant Films Limited, which also again looks at the proof of the proof that is required when you're looking at a situation in respect of a bad bargain. Now, restitution is also available, which is the return of the property which was transferred by the plaintiff to the defendant. Now, this is available where there's been a total failure of consideration. And in discussing frustration, we've seen how this operates. Now, consequential losses are also recoverable and consequential losses are where, where you're seeing a situation where if it is not too remote, the courts will allow you to recover them. Now, as we pause to go into part two, we will come back and look at how damages may be limited insofar as the quantum of damages being claimed by a party. Straight after this short break. 